Yo, good morning. How are you guys doing? Love being here. Happy birthday, Tim. Sorry for the sunglasses last week was Easter this week. Beautiful weather lately. It's a little bright outside because the sun is risen. Amen. Thank you. No, that's the worst thing I'll say this morning, but I, I think it's so cool that last week is Easter. Easter is the climax. It's the culmination. It is every single thing that Christianity hinges on. Anybody could die on a cross. I don't know if you guys knew that. If salvation was me and you dying on a cross, it would really be horrible, but we could do it. But Jesus rising from the dead proves that he's more powerful than death, sin, and the grave, and it just gets me riled up. So I love, love, love getting to speak on the Sunday after Easter, because what do we do now? Where do we go from here? What's it all worth, right? So this morning, I, uh, I love pursuit. This is not pursuit, but we're going to play two little games. The first game is what's in Brad's left pocket. We have this. I won't say what it is. We have this. And we have this. Ooh, ah. If I were to select any one of you at random, which one would you rather have? Just point to which side. Which one would you rather have? Congratulations, you have all won the game. Reach under your seat. There are $100 bills under all of them. That's not true. But why do we all value this over this? Why is this worth more than this? And to put it simply, it's because we all agree that the value of this is worth more than this. And it's pretty interesting to really think about. It's the same paper. It's the same color. Same feel. Same everything. But... The numbers on this one are a little bit different, and we all agree that this is worth more. Game number two of the day. Little uh, Price is Right action, not Family Feud. What's this worth? Just shout it out. What's this worth? 29 cents, $2, okay. Well, if you go to Costco, you can buy a 40-pack of water bottles for $4, which makes them 10 cents. Great job. I'm a pastor, so I'm, I ask you guys because I don't know. But 10 cents. If you go to a gas station, maybe a little two for two action with 7 Eleven rewards, maybe it's worth $1. If you go to an airport sporting event, this could be upwards of $10. I was at a Charlotte FC game a few days ago, and the second half had begun. Bree and I had just gotten back to our seats. We had popcorn, and I specifically asked Bree if she wanted water to go with our popcorn, but the bottles of water there were $7. And she said, No, that's not worth it it. I said, I agree. So we go back to our seats. We've got our popcorn and a few minutes go by. The second half starts and we're sitting here and then so, a, a lady comes walking down our row and then climbs up into the row behind us. And she hands a bottle of water to whoever she's with. She missed the second half kickoff. And she says kind of begrudgingly, this better be the best dang water you've ever had. <laughs> and Bree and I looked at each other because we had just decided that no, that water is not worth it. And we had a laugh. And I think it's so interesting the way that we work as people, the value of everything, what something is worth is only determined by what we are willing to ascribe to it value wise. See, if I ask you right now, would you pay $10 for this bottle of water? You'd probably say no. But what if you were marooned on a desert island and you were without clean drinking water for 10 days, you'd probably give me $10,000 for this bottle of water. What things are worth and the value of things changes based on what we are willing to give for it. That's true of absolutely everything in the universe except for Jesus Christ, which is so awesome because there are times in my life where absolutely Jesus is worth everything, but then based on my actions, my thoughts, and my intentions, a lot of the times Jesus is not worth very much to me based on my choices and my thoughts. But Jesus' value and Jesus' worth is not based on us, it's based on him. It's based on what happened last Sunday, which is awesome. So really quickly, before we go any further, if Jesus is not worth more than everything to us, then Jesus is worth nothing to us. It's kind of fatalistic, it's kind of you're in or you're out, Jesus is everything or he's nothing. And again, it's not legalism, he has grace for that, but I mean... Jesus is not really going to tolerate being number two on your affections list. We cannot live and, and, and accept and believe and claim that we follow Jesus after an event like last Sunday where Jesus proves to us that he is good, he is God, he is loving, he's merciful, and he's stronger than sin and death. We can't really just see that and be like, that's awesome. But a lot of the times I'm going to value my family over that. 
that's so cool, Jesus, but you know, a lot of the times I'm, I'm gonna spend my time elsewhere. Jesus is either everything or he's nothing. He cannot be in between. I've been thinking about this for a while. And the first time I ever thought about it, I don't know if you guys know this, but I am a pursuit kid. I attended this student ministry and in high school, I was a senior in high school, had my life forever changed at summer camp of 2013. And later on that year, it was pursuit. It was just a normal Wednesday. Um, Hux gave a message, former youth pastor. And then we ended the night with a big, huge, fun song. And everybody's up here jumping around, going crazy. Woohoo, we love Jesus. And I'm literally standing right here 11 years ago. And the song ends and everybody's having a great time. We're all having a blast. We're all jumping. And then our former worship leader prays and he's like, all right, see you guys next week. And then everybody left, but me. And I stood right here and I had this thought for the first time ever. And I just put my hands in my face and I started weeping because it was not good enough for me that we could all come here and worship Jesus and see Jesus and believe Jesus and follow Jesus and then leave. Now, of course, it's not like we step out those doors and we're not Christians anymore, but it really bothered me that we could have such a real experience with a real Jesus and worship and praise and go crazy, and then we walk out the door and we stop doing that. And I think it's so cool that Jesus is capable of transforming your whole life. I had a really deep conversation with our student pastor at the time of why that affected me so much. And he, and he kind of asked me a question. He said, Brad, why do you think we have pursuit? And this question still applies today. Why do we have pursuit? Why do we have church? Why do we have anything? And yes, Jesus, but the goal of what we do is to see Jesus change lives. Because if Jesus is not changing your life or has never changed your life or X, Y, or Z, then we're kind of wasting our time here. I would much rather join a pickleball league than be here on a Sunday morning if this is just a social get together. But it's so much more than that. It's about Jesus. It's about Jesus changing lives. And ever since that moment right there, I knew that this is what God wanted me to do with my life. Because Jesus is either everything or he's nothing. And he's so much more worthy of everything in our lives than anything else. I love Kenny's message last Wednesday. We were talking about all the people after the resurrection that have seen the Lord. All of the early apostles, a few hundred other people died for their faith. And I like that Kenny kind of, he kind of foreshadowed this week without even knowing it. But you have Saul, who's a Pharisee, who's, who's pretty socially well-known, very financially well-off, very powerful in his community. No one's life changed more than Saul's. Literally no one's. Absolutely no one. He had every single thing going for him in the world. And this didn't even happen for maybe a year, maybe two, maybe three. After Jesus' resurrection, he's traveling to Damascus to kill Christians. He's blinded. He hears the voice of Jesus. And Jesus says, hey, you work for me now. And instantly his life was changed forever by Jesus. So of all of the letters that Paul wrote, he was pretty busy. But he also had a lot of free time, a lot of downtime, because he was in prison for Jesus quite a bit. The passage that we're going to be reading today comes from Philippians chapter 3. And I think that this passage is amazing because it really shows that Jesus is worth everything to Paul. No one's life was changed by Jesus more than Paul's life. He starts out this way in verse 1. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble for me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. 
For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. This is probably one of the most impactful passages for me. I love thinking about Paul sitting in prison writing this letter. Paul wrote quite a few letters addressing quite a few different churches and addressing quite a few different topics, but Philippians stands out as the only letter that Paul ever wrote that was not specifically addressing a certain issue. He was writing the church in Philippi to essentially say, hey, thank you for all the financial support. Thank you for the prayer support. Here's some encouragement to you. Every single other letter, we're gonna get into 1 Corinthians next week. It's a little wild over there. Not so in Philippi. So Paul's just writing to them saying, hey, thank you guys so much for everything that you're doing. I uh, would love to just encourage you for a minute, but by the way, I'm in prison. So I'm I'm kind of obsessed with why does Paul say what he says? Why does Paul say what he says where he says it? Why does Paul say what he says and not say other things? Again, we say to the students all the time, the Bible is written for us, but it's not written to us. The letter that Paul wrote is not called Team Church at Matthews. It's called Philippians. So we can't just assume that Paul wrote these words to me and you, but we can correctly assume that God wrote every single word in his holy Bible for us to look at. So the question of the day is, what can we emulate from Paul's attitude? I want to break down this passage in three really simple ways and and hopefully take some things away and be challenged and also encouraged. Starting in verse 8, Paul says, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. In verse 7, Paul says, I have counted all things as loss. And in verse 8, he says, Indeed, I count. He's not flippant with his rhetoric. Paul is extremely trained in rhetoric, in reading and in writing and in communicating. It is absolutely no coincidence that in verse 7 he says, I counted, past tense, meaning I did this, and then I did it, and then I did it, and I did it. It's not a one and done. He's saying, I counted. I have counted every single day. I've considered what I had. It's worth nothing. Verse 8, and now, right now, I count everything as loss compared to knowing Christ Jesus. Paul had everything going for him. Whoever is the most wealthy person in this room, Paul was more wealthy. Whoever's the, more powerful, the most powerful person in this room, Paul was more powerful. Whoever's the most successful business owner in the room, Paul was more successful. Whoever's the most religiously zealous person in the room, Paul was more so. And he has this experience with Jesus and he says, all of that stuff that I used to have is worth Nothing to me compared to knowing Jesus. Every single thing in the world to Paul compared to knowing Jesus was worth nothing compared to knowing Jesus. How much you desire to know Jesus is a reflection of what he is worth to you. And again, it can really kind of slip into legalism here, but but look at Paul. His former religious zeal, his former status in the community, his former business ownership, his former wealth, his former friends, his former communities, every single thing in his life is worth nothing compared to knowing Jesus for Paul. So I guess my question for us is how how much do we value knowing Jesus? Because again, this water bottle, you can go to Costco, get 40 of them for $4, 10 cents. You can go to an airport, probably eight or $9 for this. But how much is worth knowing Jesus to you? How much we desire to know him will reflect to our own hearts how much Jesus is worth. Paul here put a personal relationship with Jesus at the very center of his and all of Christians' lives. He joyfully accepts the loss of all things for the greatness of this personal relationship with Jesus. He is eager to tell the church in Philippi that everything he used to have is worth nothing compared to knowing Jesus. Now, it's interesting that we should point out here, everything that Paul was talking about, all of the things that he has counted as lost for the sake of Jesus, all that stuff was good stuff. It's not like he's saying, you know, I used to struggle with this, but that's worth nothing compared to Christ. Pause. If there's sin in your life, 
and you're kind of, you kind of like it, and you're kind of engaging in it, and you kind of know that God doesn't like it, and, and you say, you know what, Jesus is worth more than all that stuff. Yeah, obviously. That's not what Paul is talking about. Paul is saying, all of the good stuff in my life, my family, my money, my success, my roles, my reputation, everything good is worth nothing compared to knowing Jesus. Paul's value, Paul's, Paul's worth, finding his own worth, finding Jesus' worth is reflected in him saying, everything is worth nothing compared to Jesus. So if I were to ask you, well, what's Jesus worth to you? And you said everything. How much do you seek to know him? I love having this conversation with students because I love it when students come to me and they say, well, I really want to read my Bible. Yes, awesome, do that. What time do you wake up for school? 7.30. Oh, okay. What if you woke up at 7? Well, you know, go to bed really late and then I got to wake up and get ready for school and then that just doesn't leave me a lot of time pause. Words are great, but you're telling me that you value sleep more than you value knowing Jesus. It's just true. So how much do you value knowing Jesus? Because how much we want to know him will always tell ourselves what he is worth to us. Actions speak way louder than words. And I love Paul here. He's saying, hey, do you remember who I was? Do you remember my status? Do you remember my wealth? Do you remember how famous I was in the world of Phariseeism? And now all of a sudden I'm here rotting in a prison cell and I love it because I get to know Jesus and that's worth more. What prevents us from wanting to know Jesus more? What prevents me? What prevents you from wanting to know Jesus more? I think a lot of us are probably comfortable in our faith. A lot of the time our faith doesn't really cost us anything, so we kind of just got it in our pocket and that's a thing that we do. But again, last Sunday was Easter and Jesus is alive and he's defeated the grave and he sees me and he sees you and he loves us mercifully, graciously, and we're like, yeah, I have enough of that. I'm good with my Jesus quota, it's in my pocket. I know him enough. What's preventing you from wanting to know Jesus more? Because how much you desire to know Jesus is what he's worth to you. And remember, he's worth everything or he's worth nothing. Paul continues verse 8 into verse 9. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Student ministry note. That word rubbish, it's a naughty word. That's how serious Paul is about this. Every single thing in my life, not only do I count it as loss, but compared to knowing Jesus, it's utter garbage. It's refuge. It's poopy. It's just true. Those are the words that Paul used. Kind of an explicit word to get a point across. Paul considers all the great things that used to be in his life as rubbish, garbage, refuge. The Greek word is skubalon. You should Google that. Compared to having Jesus. The Bible is so vivid about the cost of following Jesus. And again, Paul is eager to tell them how much he has sacrificed. Whatever you sacrifice the most for is what is worth the most to you. Whatever you sacrifice the most for is what's worth most to you. I really like running. I also really like my wife and my three sons. However, my three sons are a lot of work, believe it or not. So my wife stays home with them. So I would love to help out my wife and be around and be as hands-on as I can be because I have a full-time job, so I'm kind of gone a lot. But I really like running. I might look tired. I probably drink a lethal amount of caffeine every single day because most days I wake up at 4 a.m. so I can go running and hopefully, depending on what the workout is, I can be home by 6 a.m. and hopefully I can walk in the door to a quiet house. But, you know, some days the boys are already up, so I'll go scoop one of them up and we'll lay on the couch, watch pickleball and let mommy sleep. I really like sleep, but I like running more and I like my family the most. So I sacrifice sleep and time based on what is worth the most to me. And the same is true of absolutely everything else. We will always sacrifice what we care less about for what we care more about. We will always sacrifice what we care less about for what we care more about. 
I love how Paul says it in the beginning of verse 9 too. He says, and be found in him. So my question for you as we reflect and look at Jesus is, what do we sacrifice the most for? Jesus is worth everything. But what do you sacrifice the most for? What do you want to be found in, as Paul says? Because again, we will always sacrifice what we care less about for what we care more about. I love, 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 love challenging and encouraging students because Jesus is everything. Jesus is worth everything. He's worth my whole life. But he's not worth every Wednesday. Mm -mm. I got to work because I got to get the money up, got to get the bag. You know, sometimes I, I do have practice, sometimes, so Jesus is worth everything, but not that Wednesday. I love Jesus, and I, I know that going to church doesn't make me a Christian in the same way going to McDonald's doesn't make you a Big Mac. And I value Jesus, and I value church, but I can't be there this Wednesday because I value X, Y, or Z more. Whatever we sacrifice the most for is what we care about the most. It's just true, and there's no two ways about it. And I think that Paul would probably look at my life and your life and have some colorful words. Because again, I just want to take note, we had just about double the amount of people in this room, in this service, last week than we do right now. And I think a lot of us would say, yes, Jesus is worth everything, but not the Sunday after Easter. The weather's really nice, we're going to head out of town, we're going to go on a family vacation. Okay, Church does not equal Jesus, but I promise you that if you are in Christ and you value him, you should value time with the saints, the fellowship, worshiping Christ, reading of his word more than anything else. Yeah, I really want to get in shape and I value going to the gym more than anything else, but I did skip a few workouts. Then don't say that. You will always sacrifice what you care about less for what you care about more. Is he not worth every Sunday? Is he not worth every Wednesday night? He's worth everything or he's not? It's just true. What do you want to be found in? What do you sacrifice for? I love, love, love the saying, church should be the reason that you miss everything else. But all too often in our culture, it's everything else is the reason why I miss church. Online church is great, but it's not this. Reading your Bible by yourself is great and personal devotion is absolutely the most important thing. But if we don't value this, I don't think that we value Jesus's words. I don't think that we value Paul's words. And I don't know if we can say that Jesus is worth everything else. He's worth my whole life. But a 70 minute service on a Sunday, I'd rather do X, Y, and Z. You know, my kids got a lot of homework on a Wednesday night. That's great. That's really good. I can promise you they will walk across the graduation stage. And I can also promise you that they will stand before Jesus Christ and give an account of their lives. What's worth the most to you? Because we will always sacrifice what we care less about for what we care more about. Paul goes on in verse 9, being found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain resurrection from the dead. Paul was so set on knowing Jesus Paul was so set on having a relationship with Jesus that he was eager to share in his sufferings. Suffering is something that we shy away from. It's something that we don't talk about. It's something that we don't want at all. But the life of Jesus probably had more suffering in it than anything else. And Jesus was worth so much to Paul that he says, whatever I have to do to know Jesus, I will do that. And Paul understands that Jesus being worth more than anything else will lead to some earthly suffering. Notice that it says earthly suffering. I I, I like to think that Paul probably never one time ever missed his old life. He was shipwrecked. He was beaten almost to death. He was stoned, should have killed him, but they didn't. He was in, in and out of prison. Paul did not live a very good life. He suffered a lot. And I guarantee you that there was never a moment where Paul thought, I wish I could go back to being a Pharisee. I wish I could go back to living in my mansion. 
I wish I could go back to never being hungry. Paul understands that loving and knowing Jesus, because Jesus is worth more than everything to him, he would happily accept whatever was coming his way, including being in prison. Aside from a few kings in the Old Testament, Paul, Saul, probably had the most comfortable life of anyone in the Bible. Of anyone. He was so rich. He was so powerful. He was so famous. He was living so good. And then he meets Jesus, sees what Jesus is worth, and spends basically the rest of his life in jail. Happily. Because Jesus was worth more to Paul than anything else. Than anything else. So Easter is awesome. I love thinking about Easter. And I I think I spoke this Sunday last year too. And I, I always think about Easter, the day, the thing. We love it. As we should. It's the biggest celebration of the year. The sun is risen. I was cracking so many corny Christian Jesus jokes last week. Because it was just so awesome. Like Jesus is literally alive. That's incredible. And we get to share in that newness of life. And that newness of life kind of wears off on Monday and kind of wears off on Tuesday. And seven whole days go by and here we are right now. What do we do with that? What is Jesus worth? How do we live in light of everything that Jesus did on Easter? How does Paul live? Nothing in his life was worth more to him than Jesus. And there's so many different directions that we could have gone today. I was thinking about Acts. I was thinking about Pentecost and all this stuff. But I thought, how could we live and see and believe Easter? And then this week, our whole mindset is different. Because Easter is the day that Jesus proves that he is worth more than everything. But it will lead to some earthly suffering. Just a few Years after Paul wrote these words, he got his head cut off, probably with a smile on his face, because Jesus was worth more than anything to him. The apostle Peter was crucified upside down at about the same time that Paul died. The reason why Peter was crucified upside down is because as they were nailing him to the cross, he said, please, I'm not worthy to die the same way that Jesus died. Because Jesus to Peter was worth more than anything else. All of the other disciples died brutal deaths because to them, Jesus was worth more than anything else. So much so that it changed their whole lives and they gave their lives because of it. I said that, but that's not true. Because there is one disciple who Jesus was worth roughly 30 pieces of silver for. Judas betrayed Jesus. And that's how the story goes. We all know this. And we can read the Bible. We could laugh at the Israelites. We can look down upon Judas. But how often do me and how often do you betray Jesus for a whole lot less than 30 pieces of silver? And he's so gracious and he's so merciful and he's still there and he's still worth everything despite my actions or your actions. And he's waiting for us with open arms. But how much is Jesus worth to you? That will change everything in your life. If you honestly look at your own heart and your own mind and your own actions and your own life, this question will change everything. It's a dangerous question because he's worth everything or he's not. As I was thinking about this this week, I was typing these things out on my iPad and I was like, man, this, I, I hate to sound like a legalist because again, I'm not judging how much I like you based on how many Sundays a year that I see you. Oh, this person doesn't love Jesus that much because they weren't at church last week. Mm, They're on my list. I don't operate that way. But if Jesus is worth more to us than anything, how could we not value this right here, right now? How could we not value coming together, reading his word, worshiping, fellowshipping with the saints, as the Bible says it, more often than we do anything else? You can come to the church during the week and just sit with me. Don't do that. But you can. I don't know. There's home teams. How many of us value our home teams more than anything else? How many of us value getting together and opening God's word more than anything else? Because we probably should. How many of us value 
the church and fellowship and learning so much that we force our kids to go to pursuit, which you should do. It's awesome. But how much Jesus is worth to us will change our lives. And again, I don't want to sound like, oh, you have to do this and you have to do this and you have to do this, but how could we not? Because the, the, the end of the story is not how, how good or how bad or what we do or what we don't do. The end of the story is that Jesus has already proven how much we are worth to him when he died on the cross. And we celebrated that last week. So yes, is Jesus worth more than everything to me and to you? We would love to say that and our actions don't always reflect it, but praise God, he is still powerful and reigning and it doesn't matter what we do, he is still God. And praise God that his affections and mercy and grace towards us are a lot bigger and stronger than ours are towards him. So yes, Jesus is worth every second and breath of our lives, but let's never forget all of that is because he already showed us what we were worth when he died on the cross for me and for you. And because of that, we get to live a life where Jesus is worth more than everything. We get to live a life focused on why Jesus is worth more than everything. So be encouraged today that it, it, I mess up, we all mess up. We don't always value Jesus above everything else, but he's still worth more than everything because he has showed me and you what we are worth to him. And he rose from the grave. He beat it, he proved it. And because of that, we can live a life of thankfulness, of joy, a response that he is worth more than everything. It's a privilege, not an obje- ob- ob- obligation. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you so much, God. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. We thank you that even whenever we live a life that reflects other things being worth more than you, God, your worth is not dependent upon our affection, but God, your worth is dependent upon you rising from the grave. God, we thank you that you proved to us how much we are worth to you. God, I pray that every single person here could see that, be encouraged by that, and ultimately live in the life change that you died to bring about. And God, that you rose to ensure was a possibility. Jesus, we love you so much. God, we thank you that you are worth more than anything. Help us to see that, to believe that, to chase that, and help our lives to reflect that. Jesus, we love you so much, and it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Thank you.